Well, don't watch nothing, soon we'll be flexing. Yeah, yeah. Flexing on them suckers, man, cause they deserve it. They deserve it. They deserve it. I swear, money and women, I'll be obsessed with Yeah. We do this hustle, man, I swear I deserve it. Swear I deserve it. Swear I deserve it. I swear, damn, you're gonna make a nigga reload. You're gonna make me reload. You're gonna make me reload. I didn't wanna reload, but now you're gonna make a nigga reload. And now I gotta reload. I didn't wanna reload. But now I gotta reload. And I'm back. I got the, the juice like Rupert Khan. I got the juice like Rupert Khan. I give a fuck what them dudes be on. I get to this money fly. Honey, roll my soapies long. And these rapping niggas thought that I would soon be gone. My play, I ain't going nowhere. I be on the corner, cause my favorite word, though, like Homer. Daily pressure's got me stressing why I'm never sober. Relieve my tension when she blow it, baby, when you're coming over. Cause I, I, I've been grinding all week. Ten toes down, I've been out in old sleep. Only roll with shepherds, nigga, I don't know she. If we in the building, bad, that's some gold teeth. Bail out, token on the dank, bail out. Chasing on the guap, bad pounds. Repping for my town. I love so we are here to celebrate, obviously, the 20th anniversary, but Jordan Brand are continuing the story of Space Jam. Um, and if you keep an eye out December 1st in... You know, on all your social media channels, Foot Locker EU and Jumpman 23, there's going to be a little sneak peek about what, of what, what's to come. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, of course, the film actually came out in 1996, 20 years ago. A lot actually happened in 1996. Um, to wrap up, I'll give you some plays the best I ever done it. Tupac, he died in 1996. The ni Nintendo 64 was released as well. Anyone remember the Nintendo 64? Okay, you guys are really showing your age, right? The first, <laughs> the first ever flip phone came out in in. in Who remembers the first ever flip phone? <laughs> Motorola. <laughs> okay, Michael Crane, you know. Jordan as a brand, we always lead through innovation, and I know nowadays we kind of see Jordan as a retro uh, brand and like a, a sportswear brand, but we need to remember that when these shoes came out, they were the most innovative of their time. We've got the best of all time, the greatest of all time, wearing these shoes to play, right? Michael Jordan, I'm um, doing some crazy things on the court, literally flying all over the place. He wouldn't be do that, and he wouldn't take a shoe if it wasn't good for him, good for his game. Um, so we've gone through the range, of course, leading with the one and now all the way up to the 31. Um, so you've got people like Westbrook and a few other NBA players wearing this right now. Um, but what's significant of this shoe is, I, I love this, and, and me and Michael were talking about this earlier actually, I, I personally feel like this is um, my favorite kind of Jordan performance shoe of today, and I've worn quite a few over the years. Um, but what's significant and awesome about this shoe is the, the kind of throwback to the one. It's very intricate into the way you can design and, and what you can kind of put on the shoe, right? So areas where you need a little bit of kind of lightweight, need a little bit of flexibility, ideally around the front of the shoe, you have kind of a looser weave. Places where you need more stability, you have a stronger weave, so right in the middle. Um, and then the beautiful thing about this as well, so you might not be able to see it at the back, but um, after maybe have a closer look, you can see how it goes from a weave material and then goes into a leather at the back. But those at the back, can you see that? Or does it all look like one material? You can see it. Yeah. So it's, it's awesome the way you've, you've kind of integrated those two materials together, something that's not easy to do. So the reason behind that, again, lightweight at the front, they give you the stability. Um, no one wants a uh, sprained ankle here, right? That's probably our biggest fear as a basketball, basketball players, right? So this gives you the great stability at the back. And then for the midfoot, uh, we've got what we call flight speed. So some of the guys were wearing, the, the guys, the fellas at the back actually had tried these on um, earlier on. And what they said, they said it gave him a bit of pop, right? Am I right in saying that? Gave him a bit of, bit of a spring. Us as ball, ballers, we all, always want to jump higher. I know I always did, right? Um, everyone always <laughs> wanted to jump higher. So this is like a really premium kind of plastic called P-Vax. And it gives you great pop because it's underneath a, a zoom unit. So everyone knows the Air Max, right? Yeah? So zoom is it's a little bit lower, gives you a little bit more spring. And those two work together, these make you do make you feel like you can fly. Maybe not like Jordan, but, but you get a little bit higher up there. But I love them. I love them. Nice shoes. These shoes behind us are, as, as Manny mentioned earlier, it's the first time these have ever been on display. And the collector and a, a Brixton local, Gerard, is here today. And we're going to, uh, first time really, we're going to ask a couple of questions. Would you say he's got the best collection in the world? Personally, I would say he has the most impressive collection in the world. 
And you chose that natural one. If we're talking about Shit. historical art pieces, you did crazy. Love that. Round of applause to Gerard. <laughs> okay, Gerard, so how did it all start for you? When did you start collecting? Um, I think, yeah, I definitely started collecting in about 91, 92, when the six was in, and um, that was a model that, that, I, that I got hooked on. The but Jordan I, six. The Jordan six. But I, I had uh, older friends, older cousins that would give me their old stuff. I mean, when, in, when it was the six was out, I actually had one, two, three, four, five, six, all the same kind of mix. And from that point on, it kind of just started and just snowballed into this various phases of collecting, collecting regular shoes and just beat up, then from the collecting samples and getting out of samples and going back to OG shoes, original roots, then going into these art pieces, like historical pieces that are moments in time. So it's just grown and shaped over the years. Okay. So now these pieces behind are considered PEs. Yes. For those who don't know what PEs are, could you explain it the and why they're so different? The term PE means player edition or player exclusive. Um, each player, each athlete in most sports gets taken care of. And if you'll notice, if you'll speak with athletes, you'll get them to wear test shoes, you'll get them to give you advice on, or feedback on what they want out of the shoe, or you, talk, you think about performance, even though getting involved in this aesthetic. Um, and they want to make these shoes for the players that m they would not sell retail. So there are two different types of PEs. There are what I call true PEs, which are totally distinctive from anything you'll see in the streets and in retail. Then there are the PEs that are exactly the same as the ones you buy in retail, but they're higher quality. They're, they're being, they'll, they'll have specific coding for the athlete. So it's just differentiating from regular retail shoes to shoes these guys are actually bowling. And they get them in advance with everybody else and all that. And as I said, for where it's uh, I came down to London, to Brixton, from Liverpool in 1980. And I joined the Crystal Palace Club, which was, a very was the most successful club at the time. One of the things that shocked me was the lack of opportunities for young people in inner cities to play basketball. It just didn't... Crystal Palace didn't have any inner city kids. So I decided with a couple of colleagues to start a team in a club in Brixton. And by 1984, we entered the league. And uh, in those days, it was, it was astonishing. We used to have um, training was the same as now with the young ones, six to eight. And then eight to 10, you had the women on one side, the men on the other. And then the following week, the boys, the men would be on that side, the, the, the seniors on the other. And we used to get too many people come to training. We had every young person, black, white, male, female, talented, not so talented, came to Brixton. So the, it, the success was immediate in terms of talent ability. Uh, that's how we started. That's how we started. Yeah. Did you compare the Brixton success to the rest of the country? Sorry? Did you compare the Brixton success to the rest of the country? Well, it was also a time when there'd been some inner city turmoils, uh, disturbances, riots, call it what you like, mm -hmm. throughout the country, and one of the most well-known, well-documented was Brixton. So I was, I came from an area similar to Brixton, Toxford, which had a similar negative attitude towards it, and it seemed to be, and I just seemed to think it was ironic, coming to London and listening to people talking about Brixton, this was 30 years ago, 35 years ago. Oh, you can't go to Brixton, it's blah, 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 blah. And I, I couldn't understand it. So that was that one of our primary objectives, to change that negative attitude about Brixton. And Token on the dank bail out, chasing on the guap bear pounds. Repping for my town, hello, London City. Soon to have the crown, hello, they fly with me. Sky high. Pull my tugs out the mud, but we still shine up like a diamond. Didn't want to look when you was dirty, but now you glisten. They be like, what you finding? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm four or five seconds from wiling. Tell them where I want to be.